today I'm going to address the question of uh, why is talking about AI so exciting? You all came to a conference called Rise of AI, and things that rise usually are exciting in some form. Uh, I mean, I can't, I can't think of many things that rise. There's AI and there's Cthulhu maybe, or populism, but that's about it. Um, so um, AI obviously is exciting. However, um, you will notice that there aren't any AIs in the room. So look around. Um, doesn't look like uh, AI is something that's done. We haven't figured it out, and Christoph uh, von der Malzburg uh, certainly made a point about how hard it is just now and how far away we are uh, from uh, proper AI in the true sense of the word. So in technology, usually, um, the rule is demo or get the fuck out, um, and that doesn't seem to be the case uh, when talking about AI. So why is that? Um, today, Today, AI, would, that would be my take, doesn't exist, it's a fantasy. Um, we have made great progress uh, in pattern recognition. That's, you know, we input a bunch of pixels uh, and we get some categorization out of it. Here's a bunch of pixels, this is a giraffe. That's something we have gotten very good at uh, over the course of the last couple of years. That's deep learning. And we've also gotten very good at uh, what my company does, reinforcement learning, which is connecting some form of pattern recognition to some form of system that acts based on the uh, data that comes in from the pattern recognition system and uses the results of the action to improve the pattern rec recognition in the first place. The important thing to notice, um, all of this is almost instant. So in the middle between these perceiving and acting systems, there should be a little black box that does the actual thinking. And nobody today has any idea what to put in there. We haven't figured this out. Computers today can't think. That would mean take into account context, take into account you know, a cultural background, make a long winded plan, do deliberation, make a strategy that maybe you set aside and then after two years of just from internal drivenness you come back to the strategy and see, see it through. So none of this today exists and it's also important to note that um, we won't scale our way out of this ignorance. We can't just throw more and more interesting data at neural networks and then suddenly, magically, neural networks will start to think. That's not what they're made for. They're pattern recognizers. So today, um, AI isn't there. It's just not there. Um, it is very much a fantasy, and it is a fantasy that has been around for a very long time in science fiction. And uh, I'd like to make the case in this talk that uh, this precisely, uh, and in the very best sense of the word, is what makes it exciting. Um, this is something that sets AI apart from other technologies that you know, we are getting good at uh, recently. Um, because science fiction isn't just a random pastime, something we enjoy when we're young and then uh, we give up on it, up on it and uh, there's no consequences. So here's a science fiction writer from the 1920s. This is Max Vallier. Uh, he was born in uh, 1895 in Bozen. And um, in 1919, he published a science fiction novel in Innsbruck uh, called Spiridion Iluxt. And um, this picture uh, of him is from this book. It's self-published, so nobody stopped him from making the self-description Flieger Schriftsteller Vortragskünstler. So that's how he liked to be seen. Yeah, he was a man of... He, he, he would, that's what, that was for the ladies, right? Um, but that's, that's Max Vallier. Um, and in this uh, book, Spiridion Elux, um, Spiridion is the main character. It's a bit like him, very talented, uh, knows many things. Um, and Spiridion builds a lot of technologies, uh, for instance, for flight, uh, and he's also good at philosophy. And um, he falls in love with a girl, and she doesn't love him back, so he gets very angry. Uh, and he uses his prowess to go to space using rockets and uh, uses a device that is vaguely recognizable as an atomic bomb to destroy the Earth because he's so angry. Um, so that's, uh, that's Max Vallier in 1990 for you. I'm going to read a brief passage uh, from this. Uh, sorry for those who don't speak any German, it's just too nice to skip out on this. Mit einem Aufwand von Hunderten von Millionen hatte er sich einen fabelhaften Nautilus gebaut und damit Kapitän Nemo gleich aller Meere Tiefen durchkreuzt und nun vermaß er sich durch das Radiums und des von ihm entdeckten Nitoniumskraft entgegen aller Erdenschwere gegen den Mond zu fliegen 
Und so in glorreicher Apotheose im Glanze von Sternenkronen ist den Göttern gleich zu tun und die Erde unter seinem Fußtritte versinken zu lassen. This very same guy, 10 years later, uh, he's in Germany by now, um, is the founder of a thing called Verein für Raumschifffahrt. This is 1929 now. Um, and he creates prototypes for rocket engines. Uh, this is the Vallier Rückstoßwagen, number six. Um, and on the right, you can see he also uses this to test whether you know, rocket engines produce enough lift to get people actually into orbit. So um, that's, uh, that's what he's looking for. Um, he blows himself up in uh, 1913 and is uh, considered the first um, person who dies from spacefaring before it was uh, invented with the successor of uh, Rückstoß vehicle uh, uh, or Rückstoßwagen uh, six, uh, 6. So the number 7 killed him in 1913. What happened before is that when he pitched his scheme of rocket-based mail delivery to Deutsche Reichspost, he met a guy called Werner von Braun. And Werner von Braun was very fascinated by the idea of building rockets. Um, and famously, um, a couple of years later, um, built Aggregat 4, better known as V2, which the Nazis used to terrorize uh, most of Western Europe. Um, and then he and his people and the rockets were taken to the US and pretty much kick-started the American space program. So there's a direct line, if you want, a direct causal tradition uh, and line from this mad guy in the 1920s uh, to even today's American uh, space technology run by people like Elon Musk. So, um, when, you, when you want to design rockets, what, what are the ingredients? The rocket itself is pretty much shaped by what it's supposed to do. You can't build rockets in any shape you like. You can make them square. Um, you need to take into account all the constraints um, of technology and physics, um, and the object that you get out of it is almost fully defined by um, you know, the physical constraints and the constraints of gravity and fuel and uh, whatever you need to do to build rocket engines. So that you could consider the universe's contribution to a rocket. Um, it needs to look like this if you wa really want one. A human contribution is wanting one and wanting it very badly, so badly, in fact, that you blow yourself up getting there. Now, why are, doing pe why are people doing this? You know, why, why, why blow yourself up for something, uh, something like this? And my take would be there's a class of technologies that um, are distinct technical possibilities. It doesn't work for things that are just pure fantasy. It needs to be doable uh, in a form. Um, and those technologies have the distinctive property of freeing us from one specific limitation of the human condition if realized. So these are technologies like flight. So we, we don't, you know, we're not bound to the, to the ground. This was in science fiction all the time. This, these are uh, technologies like rocketry, where you can go to space. These are technologies like VR, where you're not longer bound to, you know, this bag of weak flesh when you want to experience something visually exciting and fly through a canyon and need to drag this lumpy thing around. Or uh, technologies like AI, um, where, you know, this could deliver us from the ever-maddening abyss of human stupidity itself, if it ever worked. Um, and in science fiction, uh, these technologies are very prominent, um, but there is more. Um, in science fiction, there's one additional component um, that I call the glow. This is the, the, the thing that makes you want to turn that page, that gets you really excited, like a cold fire in the dark. Um, you read under your blanket, you don't give up on it. It's something that's very specific to good science fiction. Um, and um, in a, with an almost feverish quality, um, these uh, books and, uh, and movies make the technologies they uh, present exciting. And that's the thing that only literature can do, that only language can do. Just by looking at the technology and the physical constraints, you don't get that. That's specific to science fiction. And to illustrate how this works, I'm going to read a passage from uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer. I would assume you all know that, but um, again, that's so nice uh, and so illustrative that I'm just going to read it out to you. Um, so the protagonist's case is just testing a piece of technology that lets you experience uh, all the sensory input that another human being has. Then he keyed the new switch. The abrupt jolt into other flesh. Matrix gone, 
a wave of sound and color. She was moving through a crowded street, past stalls vending discount software, prices felt penned on sheets of plastic, fragments of music from countless speakers, smells of urine, free monomers, perfume, patties of frying krill. For a few frightened seconds, he, found, he fought helplessly to control her body. When he willed himself into passivity, became the passenger behind her eyes. The glasses didn't seem to cut down the sunlight at all. He wondered if the built-in amps compensated automatically. Blue alphanumerics winked at the time, low in her left peripheral field, showing off, he thought. Her body language was disorienting, her style foreign. She seemed continually on the verge of colliding with someone, but people melted out of her way, stepped sideways, made room. How are you doing, Case? He heard the words and felt her form them. She slid a hand into her jacket, a fingertip circling a nipple under warm silk. The sensation made him catch his breath. She laughed. But the link was one way, he had no way to reply. Two blocks later, she was threading the outskirts of memory lane. Case kept trying to jerk her eyes toward landmarks he had refused to find his way. He began to find the passivity of the situation irritating. The transition to cyberspace, when he hit the switch, was instantaneous. Okay, so all of the book is like that. It's highly sexualized. Um, there's just descriptions of acts of, sex of sexuality. There's things like uh, what I just read. And of course, the whole book is about two AIs who are sort of polar opposite, who are very attracted to each other and need to melt to form something entirely new. The book is, um, and that's William Gibson who says that, a very adolescent book, um, written by a thoroughly immature or sufficiently immature man. Let's be honest, this is you know, directed towards 16-year-old boys. Uh, and I know it works, I used to be a 16-year-old boy. By the way, there's an interesting feminist angle to this. I don't know of any female equivalent um, to this sort of fantasies. Um, so there seems to be something that's specifically male um, about all of this. So what he does there um, is connecting technology that are real techno te technological possibilities to um, things that are exciting to um, young boys, essentially, using pulp devices uh, from literature. So there's, there's, there's sex in there, there's drugs, uh, there's violence, anything that gets you excited uh, when you're a 16-year-old, essentially. But what he does there is intensify the experience of technology, something that, you know, literature adds to uh, the possibilities. Now, there are super advanced AIs in Neuromancer, and there's VR technology that even lets you experience all the sensor information from different people. And then people step out of this virtual reality and they pick up a payphone on the wall and throw in a coin and call each other. Um, William Gibson didn't foresee the cell phone. Um, and uh, you could ask, so what, what kind of a prophet is he then? Um, and this is 30 years old. Um, he foresaw AI, he didn't foresee cell phones. That's sort of weak. And my point would be, he couldn't be bothered. He wasn't interested in just, you know, technology that lets you speak to other people. Because it's not one of those liberating, really exciting technologies. Uh, the book is all about really intensifying the experience of AI and VR. So, he's not a prophet at all. Um, he didn't foresee this future, he created it. He used what he had available, technological possibility, um, and his very uh, large means of intensifying something um, to create the future um, that he describes in that book. So what seems to be going on is that um, certain fantasies of technology can be intensified, and every, every now and then a very talented writer will come along and do that, um, and um, you know, describe how it would be to uh, have a situation where this technology is real um, and would have undone one of the limitations of being human and destroyed what it meant to be human. This is really transformative. Humanity is not the same when this sort of technology is in place. And then once that has happened, these ideas are very, very hard to get rid of. They're in the world. You can't undo what you did there once you've uh, intensified them. They're not true yet, and they're not just fantasies. There's something in between. They're in the process of making themselves real. Like code from the future, as a you know, technological possibility, like code from the future being executed on current humans. Um, you can't kill those things. They're just there. Everybody wants it to happen. 
these books keep creating young boys of 16 years uh, age who become engineers or entrepreneurs and uh, you know start working on this getting very frustrated because it's actually very hard it's you know even worse than rocket science if you're in ai um, but it keeps producing us guys so what gibson does here um, and what we do all of us in the, in the in this room who are excited about ai what certainly all the people who work in AI, like myself, uh, are doing, is actually sorcery. It's the manipulation, the use of signs and symbols to bring about changes in reality, using pretty much anything uh, that we have available. Um, you know, that starts with just capital that we raise uh, uh, if you're, uh, that we rise if you're, if you're entrepreneurs to the fantasies from science fiction um, and you know just very hard work uh, that uh, that we put in i'm going to leave you with um, a quote by mark fisher um, from uh, whom i've gotten most of those uh, of those ideas um, that's in flatline constructs gothic materialism and uh, cybernetic theory fiction you can still find that in the internet archive they uh, took the actual website down when he i think when he died uh, earlier this year um, but you can still find this on the internet um, in this cybernetic age of uh, anticipative simulacra fiction is not an image of the world it forms a rhizome with the world there is a parallel evolution of fiction and the world the empirical as such is increasingly the mere playing out of what has already happened virtually in simulation that's it. Okay, let's make it happen.